Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I apologize for not being able to uh, attend, but uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk anyways. And um, so I'm going to move uh, away from sort of the, the sea ice and actually look a bit more at the land ice, the, uh, the, the two polar ice sheets. Uh, and uh, the, the, the context here, of course, is the interest in uh, the global, the contribution to global sea level rise. I will be focusing mainly on what uh, the observational records show us of the recent past. And what's shown here is a table from the IMBI group uh, to, uh, that have attempted to uh, reconcile uh, estimate of different contributions to sea level rise. And um, Greenland and Antarctica shown here in the encircled uh, portion, uh, the, the equivalent uh, sea level rise contribution from 92 to 2008 here on the left side, but then you can see an increase on the thousands uh, onward from 0.6 millimeter per year to um, 0.8 millimeter per year. So clearly those numbers are still uh, fragile, but there is certainly there's a context of, uh, of what is happening. And I'm going to uh, show a little bit of uh, from both ice sheets. So this panel, the left panel here, shows uh, flow velocities in Antarctica. These have been obtained from interferometric synthetic aperture radar. You can see these very large two uh, ice shelves here, the Filtrana ice shelf and the Ross ice shelf. And you have very large flow speeds exceeding three kilometers per year here in the West Antarctic sector, the Amundsen Sea embayment. Also shown in this panel are gas loss, uh, which is still estimated from uh, kind of flux gate methods. You see these very large uh, mass loss estimates in gigatons per year, again in the West Antarctic sector, but you see muted mass loss here over uh, East Antarctica. The right panel shows uh, ice shelf thing or thickening. Ice shelves is the portion of uh, the Antarctic ice sheet that is already floating on water. And you see again very large thinning rates here in West Antarctica and uh, either no thinning or uh, slightly thickening rates here in some parts of the East Antarctic sector. Um, a similar story told for Greenland. Uh, the top right panel shows you mass loss as uh, inferred from satellite gravity base mission. This is uh, this mass loss uh, between 2003 and 2011. And you see these very large mass loss rates near the marine margins here from the southeast Greenland. And in fact, the signal at that with time has propagated from the southeast into the west and the northeast Greenland. Uh, slight mass gains are seen in the, uh, sorry, in the Greenland interior. In the bottom left panel here shows the cumulative uh, mass anomaly in Greenland from 2002 to 2014. And you see clearly this uh, downward trend and potentially even an acceleration. The acceleration, if true, if confirmed, would mean that Greenland is now uh, contributing to more than a quarter of uh, the global uh, sea level rise. And the cumulative freshwater anomaly, although overall the, the the freshwater fluxes from green are still comparatively small compared to Arctic interior variability. You start over the period to accumulate a significant amount of uh, freshwater from Greenland. Uh, the bottom right panel again shows uh, surface height changes, so very different measure, but again, you see these very large thick rates in the southeast and again west and northwest Greenland. So both ice sheets they have in common is that you see these large change rates, especially uh, ice sheet and shelf thinning, uh, increased mass loss, increased flow speeds. You see these at the at their um, marine margins, and um, the observed changes, the timescales of the observed changes are uh, from these observations are seasonal to decadal. And so the question is, why bother in the context of decadal climate variability? We always had this notion that ice sheets uh, are sort of these small, slowly moving elephants that uh, don't do much of decadal time scales and have to wait for, for longer periods. But uh, in fact, these satellite observations and other observations indicate that um, there's, there's very large changes that are happening and uh, for, for which decadal climate variability uh, may actually be an important contributor. 
And these large-scale climate forcings may trigger small-scale processes that uh, may, might amplify these uh, observed ice sheet changes. These are surface melting, submarine melting, carving, or weakening of the shear margins. And the questions are, is the, uh, what are the major controls on these changes? These are the dynamical uh, responses, the stress balance of the ice sheets. This has been one of the major unknowns in for IPCC AR4, and I would say still for AR5. Uh, atmosphere ocean circulation changes or topographic controls. So I'm going to focus really here on climate variability because that's the context for this uh, workshop. And uh, we'll, look, we'll look at Antarctica to get certain processes here. So Antarctica, uh, large parts, uh, significant parts are marine based. Uh, you see the top right panel is a cross section through parts of the West Antarctic ice sheets here. Uh, this would be a modern day. And you see that the West Antarctic ice sheet is grounded uh, well below sea level, uh, sometimes exceeding 1,000 meter below sea level. Uh, what's also the case is see this bottom left uh, figure here from Pritchard et al. Uh, plotted the uh, bottom temperature of the ocean adjacent to the ice, she ice sheet, where you see in certain parts very large extended uh, continental shelves. Uh, see here the, the Waddell Sea, the Ross Sea where the, so the ocean interior is far removed from these large ice shelves. Uh, in contrast that to places here like the Amundsen Sea embayment where these uh, warmer waters and in some sense the parts of the ACC, the southern branch of the ACC, uh, can get very, very close to the continental shelf um, here in this area and other areas, for example, the, um, the peninsula. Uh, so this is an interesting, interesting barrier to the potential mechanism that brings warm water up on the continental shelf and into this ice shelf cavity in the vicinity of grounding heights and under the ice shelf. So it's, the right panel here shows us such a schematic um, for a bio from uh, Christian Chu from 2010. Um, zooming in to the Amundsen Sea embayment and Pine Island Glacier, um, which has uh, exhibited some of the, the largest uh, change um, we've observed in Antarctica. Um, you see the top right panel uh, shows the, the temperature um, uh, sort of off and uh, offshore of the of the continental shelf, very warm uh, circumpolar deep waters that are that are um, trying to get onto the shelf into this cavity. And Pine Island is on the on the right uh, bottom corner here. And the bathymetry is shown also in the bottom panel here. It shows you that um, uh, there is uh, the warm waters may be able to reach the cavity through uh, two distinct uh, traps in the system. So observations, hydrographic observations have been taken in the Amundsen Sea embayment uh, in, for example, 2009 and 2012. And uh, from a paper from Turi et al, they show the, the uh, potential temperature profile along these sections. Here, the top panel for 2009, the bottom panel for 2012. And what is noticeable is that in there's a very important change in thermocline depth between 2009 and 2012 period, uh, which means that in 2009, a um, uh, shallow thermocline, there was a potential much more of the circumpolar deep water to enter the cavity compared to the situation in 2012. And it turns out now that this uh, thermocline depth variability um, is determined by Amundsen Sea embayment wind anomalies, which in turn, um, it seems, are modulated by uh, Nino 3.4 um, teleconnections. And to show this in more detail, you see here on the on the right, um, you see a panel time series of surface wind anomalies. The, the uh, unfiltered anomalies are the, are the black curve uh, you see here, and annual filters. Um, Overlaying here is the, is, the, is the red curve. And also, at this figure, we show uh, sea surface temperature anomalies in the Nino uh, 3.4 box um, green. And the middle panel shows the results of wind anomalies for 2011 in the region of interest here in the Amundsen Sea and Bay again. And the, the, the bottom panel, uh, what appears to be the uh, teleconnections that link 
isotropic uh, sea surface temperature now leads to what's happening here in the Amundsen Sea embayment. Uh, similar observations <coughs> has been made by Dick Al, who show these very important potential influence uh, between SSD anomalies here in the tropics and, um, and the high latitudes. Uh, see the bottom panel the correlation between the linear um, 4 index and wind anomaly the, that exceed 0.5 in, again, the region that is, turns out to be the almonds, the embedded. So an interesting sort of climatic focusing of uh, what's happening uh, in the Amundsen and sea embayment. There's, of course, other mechanisms as well. Um, Spence et al. explores through model-based studies the impact of shifting uh, southerly, uh, th sorry, southern hemisphere westerlies, and specifically they consider the uh, shift by order of uh, four degrees southward and also increase in, in the amplitude of these wind strengths notes sort of an important uh, impact on the Ekman pumping. Uh, the con in, in fact, what they see is weakening of the nearshore at Ekman pumping and also a weakened coastal currents, which in their models um, show that the, the weakened uh, nearshore Ekman pumping um, will basically bring warmer water that is otherwise um, <clears throat> sort of uh, sub uh, subdued through the continental, uh, to the Antarctic slope front, uh, is brought up this change scenario to higher to the surface. And in the context of what we're looking at, this means that more of that warm water might be able to enter those, um, those ice shelf cavities. A bit more explorative, uh, Helmer et al. investigated the potential for potentially large changes the uh, Weddell Sea and Hilton Arana Ice Shelf, conducting um, uh, so, so a couple of climate model simulations of the 21st century. Um, they, <coughs> they, they do notice um, a sort of similar mechanisms, but in, the, in a, addition, another mechanism is the reduced sea ice cover, which changes uh, and more the near, um, the near Hilton Arana wind. Uh, wind field, and that changes, provides changes in the coastal current uh, and brings much more water in and under the Filtin Orona ice shelf than, uh, than we can see today. So these three mechanisms are all sort of really climate forcing related that, um, that we would sort of discuss in the context of total climate variability that might play a very important role in, in getting an understanding of what the polar ice sheets are doing. Now moving on to Greenland, again, to some um, processes that we see there. And, uh, this is a schematic here shown as the sort of the, uh, the inflow of warm saline um, Atlantic water of subtropical origins to the Nordic seas and into the, and to the subpolar gyre. And, um, what we have been observing is that there is, since the mid-1990s, more warm and salty waters of subtropical origins have reached margins of the Greenland ice sheet. Here, the Greenland map, what is actually superimposed, are and, uh, thinning rates um, derived from, uh, from uh, laser altimetry from the ISAT mission. Uh, this is from uh, Pritchard et al. Um, and so, just to you know, so people are uh, very familiar with um, changes in the subpolar gyre, the total variability, for example, this study by Hacken and Ryan's 2004 2009. Updates and there is a more recent update as well. Look at this in the context of uh, altimetric changes, so uh, um, more weaker sea surface height really in the subpolar gyre, which uh, is, um, is, is, uh, is related to a weakening of the subpolar gyre, the, the slowdown and warming um, again is so thought as a mechanism to bring warm, more warm water in, in the vicinity of the, uh, of the Greenland ice sheet. But we also should not forget that um, the surface changes on top of the Greenland ice sheet have also um, been important. Uh, the, the, the right panel here is from Box et al. 2013 that shows um, changes in surface uh, air temperature anomalies of the Greenland. Uh, these are anomalies uh, related to 1950, 1951 to 1980. So these anomalies show very large changes again uh, since, the, since the 1990s. And what they would do is to bring uh, unprecedented uh, uh, surface melting in Greenland. 
And so we have two, um, two drivers of, uh, of uh, we have two drivers um, can, can, pro can, can precipitate these changes. The one are um, sub, um, subsurface water, warm subsurface water that reach the, um, the, the, the Greenland ice sheet through these narrow fjords, get in contact with the terminus positions, but also surface meltwater that, um, that basically are drained to the base of the ice sheet and then provide a, a large runoff. And the importance of these mechanisms is um, shown in, tra in translating them into melt rates. Um, so melting um, provided, of course, by, by warmer subsurface waters, but they could also be uh, mediated by these freshwater inputs as runoff that provide a very strong uh, freshwater source. Uh, and through some dynamics, can amplify uh, melt at the, at, the, at the base of the ice sheet by an open so, so in that sense, these two related but different processes um, can enhance melting terminus positions, can enhance carving, and through this, through this thermodynamic effect, can have a dynamic impact on, on the ice sheet. We should, uh, we should not forget, uh, though, that uh, surface mass balance remains an important contributor to, um, to the overall uh, mass change in the surface ice sheets. Uh, here, the top right panel is uh, an, an reassessment of the balance between the contribution of uh, what's called the, the discharge, this is the, the, the ice discharge from the carving, and the surface mass balance, if we just run off changes. And um, you see that um, what the earlier parts of these, this millennium, we have um, a slight domination of the, of the, of the discharge. Uh, since recent years, uh, surface mass balance seems to be a, a dominant driver. And uh, Feige et al. have pointed out that with increased thinning of the, of the Greenland ice sheet, we will have larger variability in the surface mass balance just because of the, the more, more parts of the area of Greenland will be the ablation zone of the ice sheet. Um, we are going now also towards uh, centennial reconstruction of what has happened in the ice sheet to try to, again, um, make a connection between some of the changes that we see the marine margins at these few margins and connect those to such climate indices as the North Atlantic uh, oscillations. And with this, I conclude. So I would uh, argue again, and others in our community, that decadal variability is relevant for the problem of ice sheet changes uh, in the context of understanding recent changes and also uh, predicting uh, pot potential future contribution to global sea level rise. All the mechanisms, despite of what I've shown you, will remain rather uncertain, and so this, so a lot of this is sort of evidential. But one of the major problems that we have is the observations are very sparse; they're challenging to obtain, especially in the context of uh, process studies at these, uh, very, at these very difficult to access interfaces. And obviously, the time series are way too short uh, in duration to say anything about really decadal variability in the in the true sense of what is being discussed here. The detailed process understanding is required to unravel the link between climatic forcings and the glacial response. And what we actually do need is both small-scale observations to unravel some of these processes, but then also long-term monitoring at the marine margins to actually get a very good record that is relevant for climate studies. And so I you can see that this is a fundamentally multidisciplinary and international challenge and challenge for which uh, climate dynamicists and CLIVA have a role to play. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Patrick, and thank you for waking up so very early to uh, give that presentation in Texas. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, are there any questions for, for Patrick? Okay. Uh, hold, uh, we're waiting for some uh, questions uh, from the audience here. Okay. So in the previous uh, talk, this is uh, Paul here, um, there was a, dis a discussion of uh, impact of um, uh, cloud processes on, on Greenland, and I guess that plays into the role, the role of uh, the surface mass balance that you raised right at the end. And so um, what, what, do you see any sort of, 
could you synthesize any challenges for us to discuss uh, in the afternoon about uh, how we could uh, better coordinate those studies of, uh, say, cloud processes and uh, focused on, I guess you need, let's say, focus on Greenland itself uh, as, a, yeah. as a starting point, yeah. I think so. Um, yeah, I, I think so because the, so of course, a lot of um, attention is paid to ice sheet ocean interactions, but I hope to have convinced you that actually what's happening on the surface of Greenland is a very important contributor in terms of a, a buoyancy source that might amplify the melting at these termini positions. And um, so there are some attempts now to uh, develop some process studies, process understanding. Uh, through very detailed observations and, you know, trying to, you know, do cause and effects. And in that sense, I think clouds, as far as I can see, it's, it's not perhaps uh, being discussed in the context of such a mod monitoring system. And um, so I think that basically exchange, uh, that it extends this chain of uh, uh, mechanisms that we perhaps need to understand to order, you know, to translate what's happening at the surface of the ice sheet or the atmosphere above it to melting at the terminus position. So, yeah, it's a bit of a not binded answer, but I think it would be important for process understanding to link this to the climate variability over Greenland to runoff, which is very, very difficult to measure at the terminus position and then uh, subsequent melting at the terminus. Okay, thanks. Are there any other uh, comments or questions? All right, uh, thanks very much, Patrick. Well, thank you again. Okay, yeah, yeah oh. thank you again.